Hello, I'm Simon Kroom and I'm a Professor of Supply Chain Management here at the University of San Diego. And today I have with me Professor Michel Boudria, who's a Professor of Marine Science and Environmental Studies and has uh, a strong interest in the issue of sustainability from both uh, an educational and a scientific point of view. And so, Michel, I've got a fundamental question to ask you right at the very start. Um, what are we seeing happening in terms of climate? What's changing, if anything? Well, one of the things that's happening um, as we look at it, the first thing that we see and we feel as people is the temperature is changing. There has been a rapid uh, increase in, in the changing in temperatures. Uh, 2012 was the warmest year ever in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the last decade has seen the 10 warmest years ever on the planet. And it's not only the fact that things are getting warmer, but that we're actually seeing that the rate of temperature increase is growing compared to what temperatures were 50 years ago or 100 years ago. So one of the first things we see as we actually experience climate change is a change in temperature, and we see this um, in our days. We had uh, over 14,000 temperature records in the month of March in 2012 in the United States. San Diego had record heat in the summertime. Um, we had record heat in January. Uh, January 23rd, it was a record that beat a 113-year-old record for heat. It was 80 degrees in January. Um, so we're seeing that someone we feel the most directly and the, and, and the one we can actually get to see. There are issues with droughts um, around the world. Uh, we're seeing lack of rainfall in some areas and in some places excess rainfall. So what we're seeing is a change in the pattern of precipitation. And the predictions are that we will probably will end up having areas that are dry now will become drier, and areas that are wet will become wetter. So we're seeing those kinds of patterns. And then in areas that are close to the coast, there's already indication of sea level rise. So those are some of the really th major components that we see where people live. If we go away from where the population centers are, like in the polar regions, we see much more rapid uh, melting of sea ice, much less sea ice that's being formed, which is opening up the Arctic, which is changing things in the Antarctic, which may be changing sea level rise. And so there's a lot of scientific evidence that's showing responses of the planet to increased temperatures and then all the consequences that come from that. But how do we know this is not just natural variation around an average? So um, one of the things to think about when you look at this, and, and really what you need to think about is um, different scales. Because uh, the, the natural variability is there. There's variability within a year. So there's times a year when it's warmer and colder. There's natural variability based on latitude. There are going to be natural events like volcanic eruptions that can change things and change the amount of particulates in the air and the amount of temperature. But what you really need to think about when you look at this is, first of all, long-term scales. When you make decisions, decisions in anything, um, you don't only think about what happened yesterday. So what we look at is you look at the natural variation, and then you start looking above the natural variation, seeing are there other components that change what's going on. And if we look at the data and we actually plot over the last 100 years temperature variation based on just natural things, solar flares, volcanic eruptions, um, you find that there's not an increase in temperature. But when you add human impacts, particularly CO2 and burning of fossil fuels and changing the temperature regime, and you look at the observed changes, they match the natural plus human input and do not remotely resemble what you would find if you just had natural variation in, in the temperature regime, for example. That's, that's interesting. When we, we read, uh, as we do a lot in the press, about um, climate change, global warming, whether it exists or not, it, it appears that there is um, not a common agreement amongst climate sci uh, scientists. Well, that's an interesting concept. Actually, um, amongst climate scientists, there's a 97 to 98% consensus that climate change is happening and that it's human-induced. What you see in the press is actually, and it's been interesting, it's been studied specifically as um, a bias of fairness. You're trying to present it as a fair issue with one person on one side and one person on the other. The climate scientists, the people who actually study the, the, the information, have no issues with that. It is other scientists who may have, uh, in, who interpret the data differently, who look at the graphs a different way, who actually cherry pick the data to present their points. And, and as an example, my background is an oceanographer. So I understand the oceans, I understand ocean dynamics. I also look at long-term changes in how ecological communities respond to natural and human-induced variation. And if you think on scales of five or 10 or 15 years, you see a very big difference. When you look at the scientists that are 
uh, frequently quoted in controversy towards climate change. Almost none of them are climate scientists. They're often physicists or astrophysicists or not scientists at all. They're, they work in policy institutes. And what's been happening is that there seems to be a political layer that's been added on top of the objective scientific layer. Yeah, okay. So you're saying it's analogous to my consulting um, a chiropractor when I need uh, an eye test. Right. Or the example we say is that uh, if you happen to have a brain tumor, going to see your podiatrist won't necessarily tell you what you need to know. Both of them are MDs, but they're not necessarily the ones looking at the having the expertise that's needed to make the decisions and look at the data. Correctly. Okay, so it's recognizing that scientists are specialists in their areas. Very much specialist so. is the, the key word. You, you have to understand the system, and climate is not an easy thing. You know, we the the whole concept of climate change. The variables that work, in, that interact with each other, CO2 and temperature, sea level rise, um, melting of ice, all of these occur simultaneously and not as discrete events. And so it's not a simple science to understand. There is some complicated physics and there's some chemistry and there's some biology that falls into place. But the principles and the objective ways of presenting the data, if you look at it, there is no doubt that this is happening. This is not a it's not a belief, actually. It's a knowledge of the facts, and it's actually following the facts oh, as yeah. they are. Okay. So you, you, you're saying that the, when we're trying to understand climate change, we've got to recognize that the climate is a complex system. It's not a, you know, a, a simple correlation between one variable and another variable. There are many factors at play. There are many factors at play, and there are also dynamic factors. And so, for example, when we talk about the fact that there's a human cause to some of the rapid changes we see in climate, it goes both ways. That is, we are affecting the climate, the climate is affecting us. So it's not, a, it's not even a one-way street. And when we look at the patterns that are going on, we try to come up with predictions of what we need to, to do as far as being resilient to changes in climate. The interactions are really in multiple areas. You know, you can't say, well, I'm in business, I don't need to know about climate, or I'm in real estate, or, or, or I'm in, in the medical industry. Um, Effects uh, of climate occur everywhere. As an example, in San Diego, increased heat waves, which have been increasing over time in the last decade, have been increasing at night, have caused increase in public health issues. So your impact is not necessarily what you might expect. It's actually going to the public health realm. It's also going to the energy realm. It's costing you more money if you're putting air conditioning on. So we need to think about both the impacts and the, and the forcing factors as a complex dynamic of forces that interact with each other. Okay, can you um, talk a little bit more about your specific studies in, in terms of oceanography and, and marine science? What are some of the things that you've seen uh, since you started out in your research that, that, that make you stop and say, well, you know, this is a significant change? Well, I'll, I'll give you a couple of stories. One, one is as, uh, as, you know, as I became an oceanographer and you start learning your courses, one of the big things you study, particularly on the West Coast, um, is El Nino and La Nina. We hear about this a lot on the West Coast, these patterns that are global, that have years with excess rain or excess heat, other years that are warmer or colder. Um, and in part because the field of oceanography has advanced, but in part because people are looking at it much more carefully, and we think that there may be an acceleration of temperature regimes. El Nino seem to be happening on a shorter scale than they were maybe 20 or 30 years ago. They seem to be bigger, sort of like talking about the storms. Are the storms directly correlated to climate change? We can't make a direct causation between one and the other. We can't say because it's warmer, the storms are bigger. But the complex interactions are showing these interactions and saying that the ocean is warmer. Things have changed in the ocean. The ocean has lowered acidity. The increase in CO2 in the last uh, 40 or 50 years, which is reaching almost 400 parts per million right now, mm -hmm. is showing a decrease in the acidity of the oceans. And we're seeing this in the response of corals, for example, in response of certain organisms that are being affected in the entire community. Um, when I look at systems, I study systems over a long term, and I see anthropogenic inputs as well, so human inputs as well as natural ones, um, you start looking at the patterns and realizing there are some years that just don't fit the regular pattern. As you look at that year, it's a year that's unusually warm or unusually cold. We have to look at it as what are the anomalies? Why are things different from what has been the long-term pattern? And that's what I see really as a big change from a, as, a, as an oceanographer looking at the ocean. So. You mentioned the word anthropogenic there, yes. which is the one that we're very interested in, you know, the, the impact of climate on humans and the impact of humans on climate. 
And I mean, that, that leads us to the obvious concern is, you know, um, what's going to happen to the planet? Well, you know, when we talk to people, and um, one of the other things I'm doing with climate research is to, to develop a program for climate change education, to talk to people. What do they know and what do they need to know uh, to make informed decisions about climate? And we're working with a very multidisciplinary group to, to come up with ways of explaining these, these specific situations. Um, the one thing people uh, across the country and across the world, they are concerned about what future generations are going to deal with, what's going to happen to their kids and their grandkids. There's a very strong connection to wanting to know what is going to happen to the planet. From a human perspective, as we start seeing the trends, as we start predicting what the future is going to look like, um, there could be really some countries who virtually disappear, some island nations that are going to be, have to be completely displaced. When you think 50 or 60 percent, depending on which number you pick, of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast. People like to live near the coast. There is a lot of impacts of sea level rise there. There's a lot of impacts of demands of water. Um, and the, because the precipitation patterns are going to change, it means in areas that are already stress for water may become more stress for water. Uh, in areas in which we have ice and the ice will disappear, um, that can affect obviously the organisms themselves, but it could change human impacts. If the Arctic opens up, there are commercial impacts and political impacts to a loss of ice in the Arctic that is beyond just the fact that the polar bears no longer have a place to live. But the planet, it's, what I was doing here was I was leading you the, to the your... Planet, the planet is going to be fine. Yeah. The planet as a planet will be fine. The humans will not be. We have to adapt. Eventually, the planet will recharge. The planet's been here for 4 billion years. It has had catastrophic events in the past. The planet itself will be fine. So, Michelle, thank you. I think a number of important messages there, and not least of which is being aware, recognizing the nature of the change is quite important, that there are opportunities for business to really explore um, what these changes mean. And in terms of where we're interested in, in this program and in our studies is making sense of what sustainability means to how we identify, use, deploy, recycle, reuse, our resources. So, Michelle, thank you very much. You're welcome.